is God and our brothers and sisters to sustain us in our journey towards the end of the tunnel. Their love never changes, never wanes, never gives up. It brings us from where we are to where we ought to be. God's love can be relied upon no matter the season. It is real endless. Good evening, brothers and sisters. I can't hear you and I can't see you, so good evening, brothers and sisters. That's better. I have a confession to make. The last song talked about being me and I'd like to tell you something about myself. And maybe it's something which eventually you can feel as you become a little more mature in age. One thing I realized is that the capacity of my brain has started to shrink. It's like having the disk space which over time becomes more limited. And because of that, each time there is a talk, I try to think of one word or one phrase which would best reflect or describe or define what the talk is all about. Thank you. <laughs> For the first talk, I am reminded of the word grateful. So many times our brother Shaw mentioned that, and that is how I felt. And as I reflected on, on my own life, there are a lot of things which made me want to be grateful, or which made me grateful. For one thing, I am grateful for my family. I have, and I have to be careful about this, one wife and four kids, not the other way around. I have been part of the community since 1995 and maybe I can also share with you a little of my life as I became part of Singles for Christ. So I joined together with my wife, CFC, in 1995 and after two years we were asked to choose what our next service would be. We were given the option, serve in Couples for Christ or serve in Singles for Christ. And what we chose was Singles for Christ. And the reason was very shallow. At that time, we felt that we were still young and we felt that we could not mentor, pastor people who are as old or even older than we were. And so we decided, let's do Singles for Christ. And that's what we did. And for the next decade or so, we served in Singles for Christ. In talk number two, the session which just ended, our brother John spoke about joy. The person who led the guided reflection has the same surname as myself, not because she's my sister, but she happens to be my wife. And she brings me joy. Immense joy. In the same way that the community Singles for Christ has brought me joy all throughout the years. And as I reflected what had happened over time, I realized that most of our closest friends to this day are the people we served with in Singles for Christ. These are the people who have, whose children or have become our own godchildren our children refer to them as their ates and kuyas who during times of trouble these are the people 
we turn to. What also brings us joy is the memories of doing all the service, all the mission in Singles for Christ. And I ask, as I ask you to look back in your own memories of your first mission, the first time that you decided to go out of your comfort zone, the first time that you rode a boat, the first time that you rode a plane, the first time that you get, got stranded in an island, that was mission life. And that brought us joy. In the same way, what brought us joy were all the God children among the singles for Christ whom we ministered and that reached a very significant number. If I'm not mistaken, we have around 40 or so in anak sa asal. And most of them have come from the ranks of singles for Christ. To the couple coordinators out there, do not beware but rather welcome it because there's joy in guiding the people into a life that should be lived out as couples for Christ. Gratefulness, joy. But each time there is joy, and that is what was emphasized in the last talk, there are the so-called joy robbers and that is what the devil will do he does not want us to be happy instead he wants us to question to doubt is there really joy in our hearts and as i look back as well i realize and i begin to ask myself i told you that we have lots of people under our care when we were singles for christ's heads and as I look back, as I recall, and as I look at the present, it gives me pain when I think about those people who refused to transition to Copas for Christ, who refused to move on to handmaids, who refused to move on to the servants of the Lord. In the same way, I mentioned that we had about 40 or so God children and another confession that I need to make is that about 10% or even more of those people who are our God children have actually already separated. Is there really joy? The brothers and sisters, our third talk will focus on hope. Our third talk will focus on what we should do to overcome the questions that we have when we look for joy. Imagine this. God, who is innately good, gives us things which are innately good. And what the devil wants is for us not to see what is good. So what does he do? He covers what is good with mud, with dirt, with poop, with everything that will make us not recognize what is good. But when there is hope, what we do is take away the trash, take away the rubbish, take away the poo, one at a time, little by little, knowing that deep inside all, this, all the things which smell bad, all the things which look ugly, is what gives us joy and that is hope maybe to give us a better analogy of it we can look at and try to reflect and try to remember what happened sometime in 2017 when there was what um, a rare occurrence of a solar eclipse in the USA. Imagine, there's the sun, and little by little, it's covered. It's covered by the moon. What was once bright, suddenly becomes dark. But in the peripherals, if you look at it, we see that there's light 
there's some glimmer of hope. And that is what hope is all about. For we know that beyond the moon is the sun which gives us the light, which gives us the hope. My brothers and sisters, if we are to compare the size of the sun and the size of the moon, this is how it would look like. The moon compared to the sun is nothing but a speck. And our God, who is the source of our joy, compared to the problems that we have, is so much greater, so much bigger, that we should not let the problems of our lives take us down. Brothers and sisters, when there is hope, good things happen to us. We believe that things will be better. When there is hope, we know that beyond or after the tunnel, there's that light. Once upon a time, there was this company who was involved in selling shoes. And one of the executives had this great idea. Why don't we tap Africa as a market for the shoes that we have? And so the executive sent two of his best salesmen to go to Africa to determine what the market will be like there. These salesmen were named Pessy and Opti. So they went at the same time. Pessy went, stayed there for a week, and after a week, he came back hurriedly to his boss and said, Boss, I just came from Africa. And you know what I discovered? There's this place where there are hundreds of thousands, even a million Africans, and they don't wear shoes. Boss, we cannot go to Africa. We can never sell shoes because they don't wear shoes. A few days later, Opti came back to the same boss and made his own report and he said, Boss, I just came from Africa and guess what? There's this place, this place where there are a hundred thousand, maybe even a million Africans. And you know what? They don't wear shoes. And you know what, boss? This is the market that we have. This is the place where we can sell a million shoes. Same place, same people. One person says, sees it as a problem. Another person sees it as an opportunity. Brothers and sisters, if we have hope, we see things in a better way. And I ask you, during the times when your leaders would ask, Bro, sis, can you lead the CLP in this small parish, this faraway place? Will you do it? The Pessies among you will say, I can't. It's too far. There are no SFCs in the area. Who will be my service team? It will be just a waste of time. And the Optis among you will say, of course, I'll gladly do it. That is a place, since there are no members there, which will give us the members that we need, the members that we want. Brothers and sisters, if there's hope, we believe that things will be better. If there's hope, we tend to see the goodness of the Lord. This world as we see it right now, it's full of negativity. Just this morning, if you, if you happen to read the headlines, the body of the uh, OFW from Kuwait just arrived inside a wooden box. Yesterday, on the way here, I was listening to the radio, and there was mention of a baby, no, not a baby, a two-year-old two girl who was killed and presumably was raped. A couple of days ago, we heard of the shooting in Florida by a 19-year-old, 17 people died. And I heard 
The same thing happened somewhere in Seattle. Is there goodness in the world? With hope, we see what the goodness is all about. And at this point, I'd like to tell you the story of one of the persons seated among you. Her name is Cheryl. She is from Isabella. And then allow me to share her story. Cheryl has been with the community for about 10 years, actively serving in SFC Isabella. And in November 2016, she was diagnosed with a rare type of cancer of the endometrium, which was an aggressive type of cancer. This cancer was very rare, impacting 0.0001% of every million people. So that's even more or even less than one in every million. And Sister Cheryl was diagnosed with that cancer. Much like any one of us who would have that same news, the questions that would pop our minds would be, why me? In her case, she said, she asked, why me? I'm still single. I don't have any boyfriend. Who will take care of me in this sickness that I have? Why me? I am still in debt. How can I afford to pay the treatment? Why me? I have work. If I am sick, that means I have to go and leave. I have to go and leave for a long time. What will happen to my work? Why me? Because if it's me, who will be with me in my journey in this sickness? Two months later, she opted for an operation. It was difficult. It was long. But she pulled through. And throughout the months, little by little, the Lord answered her questions on why me? Her family supported her financially. Her friends supported her financially. Her boss allowed her to go and leave during the times that she would have her chemotherapy sessions, during the times that she would have her radiation treatment. And the Lord sent someone to be with her, an SFC sister, to journey with her throughout all the difficult moments she had from the time that she discovered of her sickness to this very day. And her question of her being alone, she was filled with hundreds of people who prayed for her. Last month, she went through a CT scan and the results were that there were no masses found in her body. Our God is a great God. A God rewards us if we continue to be hopeful. If we are hopeful, it brings peace to our soul. Again, it's difficult to find peace wherever we are right now. With all the noise, with all the distractions, with everything that is happening with this not consistent to what we want. And I'd like to share another story. This time of our sister Karen, a full-time pastoral worker of Singles for Christ. Her story deals with her father. When she was young, she already realized that her father was a womanizer. When she was young, she would wait with her mother for her father to come home each night. Sometimes he would, most of the time he wouldn't. When she was about eight years old, her father came home 
which was good, but he came home with another woman, which was not so good. And he introduced the woman to be his wife, which was terrible. A few months later, the father went home with a baby and tow. Some years later, her parents joined Couples for Christ, and Karen thought that this, this was the answer to her problems. My brothers and sisters, the reality is, even in our community, we will continue to be beset by trials. And a few years after, the same thing happened over and over and over again. Different personalities, different names, the same situation. 23 years after that incident, the father came home once again with another lady, but this time Karen was 20, 23 years older, and she already had that sensibility, that passion inside her to question, to get mad, to be angry at her father. Why? Why are you doing this to me? Why are you doing this to my mother? Why are you doing this to my family? And in her prayers, she was led to talk to a priest. And the priest asked her, if the only way for the Lord to show His love for your father is to forgive him, will you do the same thing? very tough question to answer but our sister Karen answered yes I am willing to forgive my father and she did and she expressed that her father and her father maybe that's the only thing he was waiting for all these years accepted the apology and apologized in a turn and expressed his love for Karen and the family Brothers and sisters, we find goodness in the soul of others if there's hope. Let us clap for the family of Karen. In all of these things, we realize that God's love is relentless. Can you say that again with me, please? God's love is relentless. God's love is so much, you, you, we cannot contain it, we cannot keep it, we cannot put it in any container because that container is bound to burst. We cannot put an end point to God's love because it is infinite. In our own stories, as we reflect on our lives, I'm sure we will say and we will see and we will feel that indeed God's love is relentless. And since God's love is relentless, what should we do? We have to give it back. We have to share it. We have to express it in ways which may be difficult for us. And how do we do it? St. Paul, in his letter to Timothy, gave us five ways. Five ways for us to be able to express God's relentless love. The first one is, proclaim the word. Once again, I have another confession to make. When I was younger, I had this conversation with my mother, and she said, you know what? In Tagalog, all the katikpak children, meaning us, you are extremely, you are all extremely shy. 
all of you are extremely shy. And the other thing that, that she said was, you know what? All of you, Katikpak children, you are all terrible in math. Extremely shy, terrible in math. I didn't want to believe her. I said, I can't be like that. And so I resolved, made that resolve to myself that I won't be that. And I was successful. 50% I was successful. And I now stand here in front of you proclaiming that I am not bad in math. I'm not bad in math. So I'm still extremely shy. I'm not like Shok Ariola who can sleep, dance, just do anything with this very big stage. No? When I'm here, I tremble. I'm one, you are 7,000 plus. No? That can be the most terrifying experience in, in any, any person's life. This is not my stage. Yet I am here proclaiming God's word. And why is that? Because of God's relentless love, which I have felt, which I have experienced. My brothers and sisters, all of us are called to proclaim God's word. No matter how extremely shy we are. No? If someone asks you, bro, can you give a talk in our CLP? You have five participants. Never give the excuse, I'm extremely shy. It doesn't make sense. Our Pope Francis gives us a tip on how we can also proclaim the word to our families. He says there, there are three words or three phrases which you can use. And it's very simple. And it's one way for you to be able to connect your family. And what are those words? Very simple. Please, thank you, I'm sorry. And may I add, I love you. How many times have we said those words to our families? Please, that's very easy. Thank you, maybe a little more difficult. But I'm sorry and I love you. Start with your families. Start proclaiming the word to your families and it will reach a long way. And proclaim the word to the actions that we do. Not using our mouths, as St. Francis said, but using our deeds. Next, be persistent. Be persistent. There's some things which won't finish in one day, in one week, in one month. In one year. When we proclaim the word, it doesn't mean that those we proclaim the word to will listen to us, will believe us, will follow us. So let's be persistent. Doing it over and over and over and over and over again. And I'd like to share it this time another story. The story of our sister Mel, provincial couple coordinator of SSC Neva Vizcaya. Her story began when she was still in high school and she listed things which she dreamed of happening. So among her dreams were to finish college, to land a good job, to marry someone, and that someone has to be good-looking, God-fearing, no vices. And she wanted to marry someone was older than she was. Graduating came easy, finding a job came easy, and soon after she found a job, that was when she joined Sickles for Christ. In their area, she was one of the older members of Sickles for Christ, and maybe by default, she was asked to take lead a leadership um, role. Because of her nature, she was referred to as old-fashioned, um, conservative, antique, not the most pleasant descriptions to use, 
But in spite of those, she continued to serve and she continued to have that wish, that desire to have that someone. She even pegged a date or an age when she would get married between 28 to 30. Served, she reached 25, no one. She continued to serve, she reached 30, still no one. She continued to serve, she reached 35, still no one. She stir, served, reached the age of 40, still no one. She said that in the process of serving, the people she was serving already were leaving one by one, by one because they were already getting married. So pretty soon she transitioned to the handmaids of the Lord. But God has her plans, His plans. And she met a former SFC who was inactive in the place, in the school where she was working, and the two became close. Since they were both involved in the community, she was able to convince the brother to start attending the households once again. And they even answered the questions in, the, in his step, the reflection questions together every night. For those of you who are looking for ways to find someone, I discovered that's a very effective way. Because soon after, they became a thing and they got married in the most romantic circumstances. It was a 4.30 a.m. wedding. And then, and then the husband sang ikaw to her. It's very romantic. <laughs> Looking back, she said she wanted to graduate, get a good job, check, check. She wanted find someone who was good looking oh no it's not there good looking check wanted to find someone who has no vices check find someone who was close to god check find someone who was older than her not check but god has better plans god has better plans and what was the reason? Persistence. Persistence, my brothers and sisters. No matter how difficult the things that we want are, continue to just go and go and go and go just like the Energizer Bunny. Just keep on going. Third, convince, reprimand, encourage. To share God's relentless love, we convince, we reprimand, we encourage. About a, a couple of weeks ago, I came across, I, I attended this, this seminar, and one of the things which struck me was this question. How long does your product take to reach 50 million users? Now, how long does your product take to reach 50 million users? And the first product they showed was the telephone. From the time that Alexander Graham Bell invented the telephone, it took 75 years for it to reach 50 million um, users. And the next was the, the television. How long did it take to reach 50 million users? The answer was 38 years. How long did it take Facebook to reach 50 million users? 3.5 years. How long did it take Angry Birds to reach all of you? Plus 49,999,993 other people, 35 days. And I ask you, my brothers and sisters, how long will it take Singles for Christ to reach 50 million people? It's a very difficult question to answer. But what can we do? We can convince, we can reprimand, we can encourage. Convince people who have not seen the value of this community 
to join you. Reprimand those brothers and sisters who have gone astray, who instead of inspiring other people to join our community, have turned other people away. And encourage our brothers and sisters who have opted to lie low, to come back, to enjoy, to feel the warmth and the love of community life. Once again, my brothers and sisters, I ask the question, how long will it take Singles for Christ to reach 50 million people? I know it will happen in your lifetime. Amen? Amen. You don't seem to be convinced that that will happen. Next. Be self-possessed. So this is the fourth. Be self-possessed. When I, when I first read it, it came to me as something negative. Isn't being self-possessed, being only concerned about yourself, being only concerned about what you want? But when someone told me that being self-possessed means being certain of your identity, then it made sense. Being certain of your identity, not as the world dictates it, but as how God originally designed us to be ourselves. That is the certainty of our identity. And I'd like to share to you the stories of two people who are very dear to me. These are the stories of my two daughters, Justine and Nika. Justine is um, 16, turning 17, end of the year, and she's a member of uh, YFC as well. And since she's 16, this is the stage in the life when girls become more interesting for boys and vice versa, which is one of the things which fathers like me dread especially when your children look like their mother. Very beautiful. And a little of me. We have the same eye bags. So, Justine was in this stage of her life where, where we have, um, they have those parties, they have those occasions to meet boys, and Sometime late last year, she went to the Dofas and told us, you know what, there's this party which will happen in the house of one of her male friends. But she said she did not want to go to the party. And when we asked her why, she said, because there was definitely going to be drinking alcohol in that party, and I refused to go. The following day, after that party, she went up to us again and said, You know what? A couple of my friends went to the party, girlfriends went to the party, and they got drunk. And you know what? I got mad at them. I told them off. And you know what? They listened to me. Because this is the essence of true friendship. If a 16-year-old can reprimand friends, I think the older kuyas and ates can also reprimand friends. Especially if it questions or contradicts the identity that the Lord has for us. Let us learn our lessons from our younger sisters and brothers as well. My other daughter, Nika, She's 21, and she has this list called a list of non-negotiables. That list are non-negotiable things of what she would look for for her in her future partner in life. So when I was preparing for this talk, I asked her, Nika, can I, can I borrow your list? I was afraid um, she might not lend it to me. And she said, go ahead, Papa, it's on top of my desk. And, and I looked at her, and I was expecting that the list would include something like, person should be good looking, she should be able to be able to fend for his future family. And when I looked at the list, what struck me was number one was that the person has to be a devout Catholic. 
practicing um, everything that needs to the, the sacraments as as um, as a good Catholic. The list also included that the person should love to serve the poor and that person should love children because my daughter loves children. And one of the, sorry, the, the, the very first thing in that list which really floored me was the person should love God more than me. The person whom she will consider to be a partner in her life in the future should love God more than herself. My sisters, maybe we can also take and learn a lesson from your younger sisters. In that list as well, is something which goes like, in the relationship, I want things to be certain. And when I asked her what that meant, she said, you know what, nowadays, when a boy likes a girl, and a girl likes a boy, they're a thing. What's a thing? You already are persons, then you become a thing. Isn't that going down the... It doesn't make sense. And precisely, that's why she said, I want certainty. It cannot be a thing. We have to define what it is. And so when someone, a male, told my daughter that he liked her, and I don't know if my daughter told him that he liked him as well, you know what the, the, the gentleman did? Now that I have told... Brothers, let's do that. Let's do that. And lastly, put up with hardships. Put up with hardships. Life, life, life is extremely difficult. We, we know that. We know that. And I like to share this story of our sister Jen from SFC Laguna. Her family was your CFC family. Her parents joined CFC, and as a kid, she joined Kids for Christ. And as a kid. She would dance, she would sing, you know, in other activities. But things started to turn bad when her father lost his job when she was around eight years old. And because of that, they had to look for other forms of, or other means to sustain the family. Sell eggs, sell rice as a business, but all of these failed. And because his businesses failed, the father had no other recourse but to drive a tricycle in spite of his heart condition. And because he wasn't really fit to do that, a few, few years later, he died. And when he died, the mother had to fend for the family. And the children had to do their own share, really, to help. There came a point in time when the hard decision had to be made who among the children would have to stop schooling for the other two to go? And it was Sister Jen who volunteered to stop schooling because they couldn't afford it. And what was sad was they only needed 500 pesos for her to go to a government school and yet they did not have that 500 pesos. They would spend weeks eating nothing but brown porridge, a Jollibee meal of spaghetti and hamburger was a feast they could not afford. A year later, her sister was able to get a scholarship from the government, which meant they had enough money to send Jeng to school. With that scholarship came an allowance of 100 pesos. And that 100 pesos was divided 50 for Jeng, 50 for her sister. And that 50 pesos was spent 
for her meals, for her commute to school, for all the necessary expenses. And yet she did it. And to bet that she would join contests and occasionally win in some singing contests so she'd have extra money. That was five years ago. Today, our sister Jeng sits proudly among you, a graduate of electronics engineer. Wow. She now has a managerial position in a company. She drives her own car. The family has renovated the house and is starting a new business. In all of these years that the hardship took place, Jang was constantly serving in YFC, eventually in SFC. We can repay God's relentless love by putting up with the hardships that come along with it. God's love is relentless, but God is relentless. Can you repeat that please? God is relentless. If we have a God whose love is relentless, then the God who is the source of that love is even more relentless. If there's such a thing as an infinite to infinity, our God is that. And how, again, should we respond with that same passion, with that same love? You can respond to our God who is relentless by being grateful. Be grateful in everything that we have done, received so far, even for the things which we do not deserve. We should be the source of joy we have received a lot of blessings so that when others look at us they should see joy in all of us they should see the image of God in all of us in how we live our lives in how we profess all the good values and virtues to one another and we should be the hope again Given all the dirt, all the rubbish, all the garbage around us, when we see people around us, let us be like the Manuel of yesterday, who in spite of his condition, continues to be the hope of the people around him. Again, allow me to share Another story about myself. When I was introduced, I was referred to as the former International Coordinator of Couples for Christ. That happened in August 2007 and we served until 2010. And that for me was one of the most trying, most difficult times in my life. And why is that the case? Being an international coordinator is not a very easy task. Just ask Brother Nolly Manuel, just ask Brother Shock Ariola who came before him. And it is even more difficult if you are not a full-time pastoral worker. When the question was asked of me, can you be the SFC International coordinator, I was floored. It had never been done by a non-full-time worker. But the Lord was very reassuring. I was given one week to decide, to make a decision. And in three days, the answer was clear. Yes. I don't know what to do. And looking back, I realized I didn't know what I was doing back then. But because of that hope, because of that glimmer behind the moon which was covering the sun, 
I had to say yes. Ten years ago, we had what was called then the International Leaders Conference. To Selden Clark, it was called SFC at Home, which I think, if I'm not mistaken, to date has had the highest number of attendees.